So without further ado, shall I move over to you, Wes, and give you the floor? I will, if we're coming to 10 minutes, I'll give you a slight nudge so that we have enough time for everything, but I'm sure, you'll, I'm sure your timing is perfect. Thanks, thanks, Carwin. Um, hello, everyone, I'm uh, Wesley. Uh, I'm currently based in sociology at the University of York, um, but I'm moving to the University of Warwick uh, in July. Many thanks for organizing today's discussion on masculinities in China and Chinese masculinity and to meet up some old friends on Zoom. Although I haven't carried out research on men and masculinity in China in recent years in light of my recent research on food and care, there's always something that maintains my connection with the emerging research in the field, including reviewing both Max and Derek's fantastic books, as well as supervising PhD students in relation to men and masculinities in China. Their work opened up the critical debates on men and masculinity within a global context. Peter and Cowen uh, put forward the question uh, to us to reflect on whether gender stereotype about race emasculate East Asian men. I think this is a very good question, a very good starting point for today's roundtable discussion. To reflect this question, we need to think about the theoretical positionality of responding to this question. What kind of theoretical assumption that we engage with to enable us to address this question? My reflection is, has two aspects. First of all, yes, gender stereotypes about race emasculate Chinese uh, East Asian men. This is the result of the historical impact of the representations of East Asian men in Western context and culture. East Asian masculinities often operate through two binaries in the Western discourse. Asian men are often represented as weak, nerdy, feminine, asexual, compared to the idealized form of white masculinity, which at the same time marginalize other masculinities. Meanwhile, we, there's also contradictory image of Asian men as hyper-masculine, such as Kung Fu masters or more recent wolf warrior movies in China. Secondly, I think we need to ask the question about what are Chinese masculinities or East Asian masculinities? Does Western theorization of men and masculinities have the capacity to make sense of men's lives in, cont in contemporary societies in the East Asian context? What I would like to emphasize here is how Western versions of masculinity are positioned as hegemony and we need to challenge the hegemony of particular version of masculinity. We also need to challenge the assumption that underpin the conception of identity that embedded within masculinity. Recent years, we have witnessed an emergence of new studies about masculinities in China and Chinese masculinities in a global context. For example, Mac's fantastic work about the making of able, responsible men. It explores the notion of hegemonic masculinity in China. The central question is what it is, if it exists, exists and how that dominant ideology is lived out in people's everyday lives. It is developed through a reflexive engagement with Chinese moral ethics and cultural values in relation to ability and responsibility. I find the conceptualization of able, responsible men is insightful and innovative. The material in the, con in, in the chapter of, um, is of particular significance in critically engaging and addressing the global inflected men and masculinities from a Chinese perspective and I really enjoy reading, for example, like chapter four, which capture unique marriage life for some men and the notion of marginalization. It also explores the significance of potential transformation for Chinese gender order. For example, like Derek's work, um, their, their recent um, edited book on the cosmopolitan dream, transnational Chinese masculinity in a global age, situated discussion on Chinese masculinity from a transnational perspective. The book does not simply adopt or simply uh, or adopt a Western analytical framework of transnationalism. It developed uh, through a reflexive engagement with Chinese um, historical perspective and cultural values. And it highlights some of the most significant transnational aspects of contemporary Chinese men and masculinities. 
and illustrate that this aspect are implicated with other forms of locally embedded notion of practices of masculinity and explore the significance of this shit of Chinese gender order. For example, it captured the most up-to-date um, cultural phenomenon in recent China, in relation to Chinese men and masculinity, such as the representation of fatherhood through the um, reality TV program, Father, Dad, Where Are You Going? Baba, Nichina. And more recently, my PhD student, Tao Siyang's forthcoming book, Chinese Men's Practice of Intimacy, Embodiment and Kingship, developed a new concept of elastic masculinity, which can stretch and forge differently in response to personal relationship and local realities. So the above diverse work in relation to in the field of Chinese men and masculinity and masculinity in China illustrate other possibilities and of potential configuration. For example, this work engaged with the question on what impact do the digital, the digitalization of everyday life, the uh, general, general changes and the effect of globalization on the representation of East Asian masculinities. Last but not least, there's always a danger of talking about changing masculinity without acknowledging changing femininity and women. I would like to highlight a recent book authored by Xie Kai Ling entitled Embodying Middle-Class Gender Aspirations, Perspective from China's Privileged Young Women. The book shed light on how changing femininity might have impacting on the transformation of masculinity in China and explore the lives of China's urban middle-class women and their stories of success. The book illuminates the centrality of his, uh, heterosexuality and heterosexual marriage as a primary institution in the organization and the reproduction of labor for the market economy imbued with gender inequality. It argues that women's gender subordination is often covered by a gender middle-class success story and the discourse of China of the China dream underpinned by China's neoliberal governance. Okay, I'll leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pez. That I think we are going to need a, a sort of reading list of the things that you uh, touched on there. If you feel like it, feel free to put some of the titles in the chats, and I'm sure the a hundred people here would love to check out some of those books if they haven't already. Um, shall we go over to you now, Mag? Yeah, okay, uh, thank you. I want to start by talking about the news events, uh, about the, uh, the concern of feminization of young men in China. So last year, uh, last year, during the two sections, that is one of those big meetings, political meetings in China, around May, um, a political advisor, also a member of the National Committee of the CPPCC, talked about a masculinity crisis that he said could become a national security crisis in China. I think many of you uh, would be aware of that news event. So what he talked about was that boys are becoming too soft and delicate and androgynous. So if the feminization trend is unchecked, um, the speaker said that uh, this can cause problems for even the existence and the uh, development uh, of China. Okay, so that new or that report did not did not arouse much discussion at that point in time in May last year. But then the Ministry of Education responded in a public statement in January this year. And then it provoked a widespread discussion and uh, debates on the internet among uh, ordinary people as well as professionals. Uh, so we can hear different views. But then my, uh, well, okay, the Ministry of Education said that uh, in the future, the education system or the curriculum has to change so as to toughen up the boys, all right? Uh, introducing more education classes, more male teachers and more gym teachers who are professionals. So the state media, for instance, Xinhua, uh, they supported the call and then they cited a, uh, they cited a, a, 
a, a remark made by Zhou Enlai, very famous one, that is the country is strong if youths are strong. And then CCTV, they also put up a notice or a post saying that the purpose of gender education is to train people's responsibility. So you can start to say that I feel very close to it because um, CCTV did talk, emphasize uh, responsibility, uh, saying that it is, the it is the purpose of education or the, one of the aims of education. So they advocate uh, more distinctive gender roles uh, and then they use a term which in Chinese is wenming qi jing shen ye man qi pi po. I find, uh, so if I translate it, it is to, uh, to make the mind civilized and the body rough. All right, Qu quite a terrible one, I think, in Chinese. All right. Um, now, this is of interest to me because uh, what they said, they do reverberate some of the observations I make in my book about Chinese masculinity. Not that I agree that China is facing a masculinity crisis or even a effeminacy issue. I don't think so. Uh, I frame, I frame as Wes has uh, briefly talked about, I frame my thesis under the concept of hegemonic masculinity. So the concept of a Hegemonic masculinity is that uh, there is a, a dominant form of masculine ideal that exists in the place at a certain period of time, and then the ideal is coercive. It coerces men uh, and make them complicit to the ideal. Those who are opposite to values become subordinates. And then the masculinity of what defines a man is, uh, I, I define it as able, responsible men in my book says hierarchical relationships between men. So those who are good at that ideal becomes uh, the superior and those uh, opposite are uh, the subordinate. And then they also set uh, uh, differences between men and women. All right, then coming to my able responsible men, to put it very briefly, I'm saying that the hegemonic version of masculinity in China in the present era is defined by the ability to make money. And then, uh, and then the, uh, the, the being responsible to society and then the country. Um, so that's my thesis. And then I raise a four distinctive features of this version of hegemonic masculinity that is different from the, uh, from the versions in other parts of the world, okay, in the present era. So the four uh, features are, number one, it is hegemonic masculinity in China is shaped by the nation. It puts priority on filial piety. It has an emphasis on duty to the nation. And then there is a relative non-significance of physical prowess in how one defines a, a, an ideal man. Okay, so you can see that taking filial piety aside, actually the other three points are not in line, but then they can be related to the to what the political advisor during the two sections and then what the CCTV and Xinhua news uh, promote. Okay, so my take is, I, I, I want to emphasize, I, I want to focus on the point about physical prowess because this is what I said is not what defines an ideal man in China. And Kim Lui, in fact, I saw Kim, <laughs> Kim Yui made an excellent point about the emphasis of uh, one over Wu historically. Okay, so th that I can't agree more. So, and in my research, I do have a chapter about teenage boys. And I do say that uh, teenage teenagers in China are seen as uh, effeminate by their parents and their neighbors. They are criticized for being not tough enough and they're not man enough. But then the problem is not that they are too pretty or too much like a, a fresh meat as it is popular in China now, fresh meat or too delicate. What the parents and the, what the parents concern are that the boys have to be able enough to make a career in the future. So I would say if they are pretty and then they can make lots of money in the future, they are still able responsible men. All right, so the problem is not about effeminacy. 
because the physical prowess or the wu side is not that strong in China. Um, but then the, uh, and then I will say that adronogy, that is uh, the trend for uh, boys to be too much like a woman wearing earrings and then putting up, uh, putting up cosmetics and then being very pampered. This is a subculture, but not a, not something that uh, should cause great social concern. That, that is my view. And then how uh, the masculinity in China will shape up in the future remains a big question. I, 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 I can't think of uh, that is without research. I, I don't want to say anything. But then my perception is that given the government is a pushing on masculinization, uh, boost, bolstering up the spirit of young or the masculine side, I would expect that the physical power will likely have greater importance in the future. And then it can even become a hegemonic characteristic. Okay. And then number two, the, num the money side, that is the ability to make money, may, de may be depressed in uh, significance in the future. But then I would expect a responsibility, that is the pressure to be responsible to society and the country to, to remain or even accelerate. Because I believe when China said something has to be done, usually something will get done. <laughs> but to what extent it will become a uh, like a hegemonic masculinity form and then in reality how masculinity will develop we we can discuss okay great thank you for that matt so with that we have about 35 minutes to go um where so we're first going to come over to uh our small round table um with myself, Mag, Wes, Derek, and Pete. But perhaps we could uh, move over to Derek first. Would that be okay? I'm not sure if you have any thoughts on what uh, Wes or Mag have said so far, Derek. Thanks very much, uh, Carwin. And thank you very much to Wes and to Mag for these tremendous, um, concise, but very rich, uh, packed um, accounts of uh, of Chinese masculinity, and, it, and it's great to see you both uh, and to see everybody on the panel. And uh, I'm delighted there's such a large audience as well. Um, uh, bo both both ways his work and Mag's work uh, uh, have been very, very inspiring to me over the, uh, the, the years. And uh, I think some of the main points that, has, that have emerged through their work and come into the field have, have been raised in, in the talks just now. And um, th this point of uh, uh, hegemonic masculinity that I think came up in um, really uh, strongly there in, uh, in Mag's uh, comments, but also, you know, it was, it was woven throughout uh, Wes's comments is, is, a, is an interesting place to start. And uh, what, we, what we've seen in China over the last um, uh, several decades has been a pluralization of uh, masculinities and where the different influences are coming from. And I think Wes and Mag just both talked about this. Is, is, is very interesting to look at. So with China uh, having much more engagement with countries and cultures, societies around the world, uh, we've seen a, a, a steady stream of influences coming in from the West this, uh, and East Asian countries and elsewhere. Now this raises the, the, the point that, that Wes was raising very specifically of how do we measure masculinity? How do we specifically um, uh, say what is masculine and what is not. And so the influx of ideas from Western countries has in a sense collided with established ideas about hegemonic masculinity in China. These are the ideas that, that, that Mag has, you know, I think Mag has worked really pinpointed this able, responsibility, able responsible man, this kind of model with its deep embedded uh, concern in, in an ethical perspective for how a, a husband and a father uh, uh, should behave. So, and, and you know, in, in terms of contemporary 
um, society, how uh, success is measured. Now that's where it then begins to get more complicated because where success is measured also uh, takes into consideration uh, financial success. And this is a materialistic, capitalistic idea that's coming from the West. And then we have the very kind of strong emphasis uh, in Western masculinity on physical uh, strength. And this is developed specifically over the, the late 19th century, 20th century in a very colonialistic uh, a uh, gendered way uh, that posits this strong, uh, the strong physicality of of the of the white uh, man as the measure of masculine uh, masculinity, and hence, as Wes was saying, the um, the kind of uh, stereotypes of emasculation of East Asian men. So, what's interesting now uh, is that we can see there's a kind of challenge uh, emerging from China to this kind of hegemony that has been established at a global, a global level uh, over the last uh, 100 or 150 years, uh, 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 with the West, Western cultures being a kind of dominant um, uh, symbolic force. Um, now, with China's um, increasing uh, economic and um, uh, uh, military might, technological might, and so on. Uh, we're seeing a a kind of um, a step up in the strength, I think, of the kind of masculine image that's coming from China. And so we're entering a period, I think, where at a global level, what is hegemonic masculinity uh, is being contested in a way that hasn't necessarily been contested uh, before. And the Chinese model, the Chinese masculinity, if you like, now that, that's a simplification because there are many uh, variations to it, it's a pluralistic situation, but the, 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 the kind of um, uh, phenomenon that we're seeing now is that uh, Chinese uh, men, Chinese uh, uh, cultural productions are posing a challenge to Western masculinity at the at the global level, and that it's no more clear than in the Wolf Warrior films that Wes has raised. It's very clear also in TV dramas that are produced for domestic audiences uh, in China, where the, uh, the the Chinese hero gets the better of the Western uh, characters. So that the, there is now this sense of a a, a, a hegemonic Chinese masculinity that is multidimensional in itself. It's composed of Western and Eastern elements or Western and Chinese elements that can take the fight to the dominant model of the uh, of, of white masculinity. And I think I, th I think this is a, a, a welcome step in some ways. We shouldn't have, uh, you know, a, 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 a situation where uh, we have the, the dominance of a colonialist uh, imperialist model of masculinity. Um, however, the question then becomes what sorts of model of masculinity is being presented by, uh, through the cult you know, cultural product productions and the, the, the kind of everyday life interactions uh, in China? And is it, is it a positive, is it a good um, uh, way in which masculinity is being enacted and represented? And I think uh, here, Mag's comments about the crisis of masculinity in China are really relevant because what we've seen is um, uh, a kind of uh, fear from the some conservative elements in the, the Chinese in Chinese authorities, Chinese societies uh, that the Chinese masculinity is going emasculated. Uh, but at the same time, there's been a and and that is 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 quite heavily based on Western uh, standards of masculinity, but at the same time, there's been very big pushback from uh, people in China, uh, not just feminists, not just the LGBT uh, um, uh, movement, but a broader pushback, saying, "Look, there are many different ways of being a man," and. Uh, there isn't a crisis of masculinity, as Mag was saying, and uh, it's insulting to women uh, as well as to men if you insist that on gendered stereotypes such as men should be tough and women shouldn't be, presumably. So I'm heartened by that uh, that shift or, the, or that, that kind of pushback 
uh, against the government. So I am interested in hearing more from Wes and uh, from Mag what they think about the prospects for the developments of of uh, uh, Chinese hegemonic masculinity, if you like. Are we going to go down the route of a more uh, uh, toughened uh, kind of wolf warrior kind of image as the dominant one, or is there a prospect that things will shift in a, a more positive direction, uh, or are we going to continue with uh, contestation between these two uh, two elements, uh, and how is that going to play out on the global stage? So that's these would be my uh, <laughs> rather large questions uh, for uh, Wes and uh, Mag. But thank you very much, both of you, for great talks. Great. So thank you so much, Derek. Um, shall we go over to Mag or Wes uh, first? I'm not sure who wants to. Wes perhaps first, as he was the first speaker. And we also have a rich vein. Well, we have a rich vein of things to sort of mine for questions, and some of them are popping up in the chat. So we'll also hopefully get to some of those uh, in after both Wes and Mag have spoken. So over to you, Wes. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Mac, And thank thanks, Derek, for the comments and um, the talk about uh, men and masculinity in China. And I think there's some really interesting point about hegemonic masculinity and the recent kind of cultural phenomenon in China or, or, or policy phenomenon in China is kind of moving away or move or, or shifting discourse of boy preferences and also uh, to the discourse about boy crisis or masculinity or masculinity crisis in China. And I think that it's important to understand the complexity of this shift um, that um, this is a, um, a strategic move to use the public discourse to make a uh, discursive link between strong uh, embodied uh, boys and building a strong uh, modern nation. So I think the discussion about masculinity and boy crisis or masculinity crisis cannot be isolated without uh, talking about nation building, about uh, state. Well, I, I think that I follow up on Derek's question and also a few other questions posted on the chat. Um, I want to clarify that by my understanding, hegemonic masculinity is a, is a uh, particular cultural ideal that exists in certain places, all right? It, it is different. So the form of hegemonic masculinity that, that has formed in China, as I observed, is different from Europe. And it is not, it is far from something about violence. So it's not about martialness or violence. And that is my main point. All right. And then um, it, it is, it, okay, I, I'll go to another point about the uh, patriarchy. I don't think that I don't think that what the government or the Xinhua CCTV people are saying about the uh, bolstering up the masculine side of men is, is aimed at uh, enhancing or stabilizing patriarchy in China. I don't think that is their point. Um, patriarchy will exist, but in China, I think it is softening. It is not a huge problem. That is, I, I, I put it in the book that patriarchy still exists, but it's not, a, it's not a huge problem for China. I would rather say the, the government or the political advisors aim is to strengthen China. So it is to strengthen China overall, to make it a, 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 a global power even, even more, even better, even more of a global power. Okay, that, that is, uh, I think, the intention or the drive behind. And in terms of the effeminacy of ch Chinese boys, is it due to the Korean pop stars, etc.? I do think it is, that, that is uh, Asians in general. In fact, not even Asians, isn't it? Around the world, I think that is a trend for the stars sometimes to behave in or to dress up or to, to, 
to present in very different manners. And being like a female in that sense, it's one of the presentation style. So it's global. The trend is global. Uh, it is happening in China, in Korea, in Japan, in Hong Kong, everywhere in Asia and lots of other cities. But this is only a, this is only a presentation of a minority group, I would say. There are the majority of, or the mainstream, not the majority, the mainstream boys in China are not of that type. So I won't even, so that's my point at the beginning. I don't see it as a as a as a problem that that the government should address that directly. Okay. Uh, so I think Mag was uh, responding in part to Kaz's question, Kaz Sutherland's question on Chinese patriarchy and how it interacts with masculinities and femininities, and Catherine Atkinson's uh, question, which are the first two in the chat. I don't know if uh, Wes or Derek have anything to say to either of those points or anything that Mag raised? Mm. In relation to uh, the issue about patriarchy, um, I think it's a very interesting um, issues um, because there's a lot of recent research highlighting this kind of transformation of Chinese masculinity or transformation of Chinese men uh, become more feminine or become you know, more uh, family oriented. But at the same time, there's another body of study about Chinese women, Chinese femininity. So for example, they highlighted about Xie Kailin's work about aspiration, about middle-class women success stories. So I think that we cannot simply talk about men and masculinity without engaging with the discussion about this transformation about femininity and women in China. So I think um, in, in relation to uh, uh, um, uh, patriarchy, um, I don't think that it is disappearing or it has been replaced. I think, you know, for a lot of research has, has, has illustrated that, that, you know, um, men and women, they always try to negotiate, actively negotiating, you know, this kind of tension between, you know, individual more neoliberal or more, you know, you know as, uh, um, empower subjects. But at the same time, they are constrained by this kind of patriarchal ideology, responsibility, such as filial piety and you know, their expectation, cultural expectation. So I think the discussion in relation to patriarchy, whether it is disappearing or whether it is you know, being replaced by these new norms of uh, gender uh, order, I think it is ongoing and it's also you know, it's a very complex process of negotiation. And uh, it's not a simple answer, uh, yes or no, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I would follow up. Um, I, I think these are uh, excellent points, and um, I, I think um, it, you know if we think about patriarchy, it, it it seems to be incredibly good at shifting its shape and its form, but maintaining the overall uh, power asymmetry between uh, men and women. So, as Wes says, this this takes place through negotiation, and there are many elements. It's worth saying that the dominant model of uh, the hegemonic model of masculinity in historic times in China was the Junzi uh, and uh, the the younger version of the Junzi, the, the, the Confucian gentleman was the Taizi, the talented scholar. Now, neither of, of neither the Junzi or the Taizi were known for their physical prowess, uh, their toughness. Uh, this comes back to uh, Mag's point about uh, Win, uh, you know, generally prevailing over Wu. So patriarchy can be exercised through uh, you know, quote unquote, softer masculinities, right? There's absolutely the caring man uh, or the sensitive father or whatever can still enact patriarchal, it can still, you know, produce uh, patriarchal social structures through uh, certain behaviors. So, it, 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 you know, it's, it's um, we have to be very careful about this, that uh, shifts in, um, uh, the way in which uh, masculinity is kind of presented uh, or uh, emotionalized and so on and so forth, uh, whether they're actually addressing the fundamental structures uh, of, of patriarchy. And, and, you know, one of the things that um, uh, I've been looking at recently is uh, male beauty vlogging. Now, in male beauty vlogging, for example, uh, we have, it's, it seems to be a gender equal 
kind of uh, activity. You know, here's the, 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 the young men saying, we want to be uh, the same as women and have the right to wear makeup and they're going to equalize the genders and so on. But, you know, if you look a little bit deeper, you find there's still a lot of uh, asymmetrical uh, images of gender in the way that these uh, beauty vloggers are presenting the uh, th themselves and uh, the products that they're trying to sell. So I, I, th I think we always have to be uh, very cautious. And just finally to say that nation is absolutely a key point here. Wes and Mag have both emphasized this. And the, 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 the aim of China and the, 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 the kind of governing stratum of China uh, it, since the late 19th century has been to create a modern China that can take its place on the world stage and be respected by other nations. And the construction of a masculinity that befits this modern China uh, is absolutely integral and central to that project. And that's why we're seeing these tensions in China now, because the, 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 the government is terrified that a suitable masculinity uh, is being eroded by the earring wearing pe uh, young men at the Xiaoshen Road, the little fresh meats that uh, Mag uh, was, was mentioning. Um, and yet there is a counter argument to say that that doesn't matter. You know, China can produce a Chinese, uh, a modern Chinese masculinity that draws on historical elements, such as you know we see from the, the these great costume dramas that are produced in in China. This, these 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 great historical elements, um, Confucian influence, aesthetically and ethically, uh, that can that can help inform a modern Chinese masculinity, and 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 you know. Uh, the big question is: Is it a is it a masculinity that's going to, you know, be gendered, sexist, misogynist, and and and, and you know that's for, for gender studies scholars. I mean, that's the, that's the big question that we're interested in. But uh, it's um, uh, you know, it's a contested playing field, and uh, we we see how it plays out. But it's very very interesting to watch. <laughs>